big surprise. She's been very accustomed to living in one fashion, which is kind of as, you know, the little lady of the house. And she's moving north with the family that used to work in their house to get farm work um, so that her mom, her mom and herself can support themselves now that their land and their income is gone. Um, and they, they're also, they're trying to sneak away from the uncle who has a considerable amount of pull in the town and wouldn't want them leaving. So they're forced to immigrate um, illegally, despite the fact that, um, you know, both families are together. So they're basically in the position of sneaking across the border 80 years ago. Um, and here, here is where they're still traveling from, um, traveling up towards the border before they actually cross the border. Uh, but Esperanza is getting her eyes opened to, to the fact that not everybody is used to living in the manner that she's accustomed to on her ranch. The locomotive arrived, pulling a line of cars and hissing and spewing steam. But they did not board the fancy car with the compartments and leather seats or the dining car with the white linens. Instead, Alfonso led them to a car with rows of wooden benches, like church pews facing each other, already crowded with peasants. Trash littered the floor and it reeked of rotting fruit and urine. A man with a small goat on his lap grinned at Esperanza, revealing no teeth. Three barefoot children, two boys and a girl, crowded near their mother. Their legs were chalky with dust, their clothes were in tatters, and their hair was grimy. An old, frail beggar woman pushed them to the back of the car, clutching a picture of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Her hand was outstretched for alms. Esperanza had never been so close to so many peasants before. When she went to school, all of her friends were like her. When she went to town, she was escorted and hurried around any beggars. And the peasants always kept their distance. That was simply the way it was. She couldn't help but wonder if they would steal her things. Mama, said Esperanza, stopping in the doorway, you cannot travel in this car. It, it is not clean, and the people do not look trustworthy. Esperanza San Miguel frowned as he edged around her to sit down. Mama took her hand and guided her to an empty bench where Esperanza slid over next to the window. Papa would never have had us sit here, and Abuelita wouldn't approve, she said stubbornly. Mija, it is all we can afford, said Mama. We must make do. It is not easy for me either. But remember, we are going to a place that will be better than living with Tio Luis, and at least we will be together. Okay. So they head on. Um, the family that Esperanza and her mother are traveling north with have a son that's her same age, whose name is Miguel. And in this part, Esperanza is talking a little bit with Miguel about what their plans are for once they're living in the United States. When I get to California, I am going to work for the rail railroad, said Miguel, looking anxiously towards the horizon. They had spread pieces of brown paper in their laps and were eating pepinos, cucumbers sprinkled with salt and ground chile. I'm thirsty. Are they selling juice in the other car? asked Esperanza. I would have worked at the railroad in Mexico, continued Miguel, as if Esperanza had not tried to change the subject. But it is not easy to get a job in Mexico. You need una palanca, a lever, a lever to get a job at the railroad. I had no connections, but your father did. Since I was a small boy, he gave me his word that he would help me. And he would have kept his promise. He, he always kept his promises to me. At the mention of Papa, Esperanza felt that sinking feeling again. She looked at Miguel. He quickly turned his head away from her and looked hard out the window. But she saw that his eyes were damp. She had never thought about how much her Papa must have meant to Miguel. It dawned on her that even though Miguel was a servant, Papa might have thought of him as the son he never had. But Papa's influence was gone. What would happen to Miguel's dream now? And in the United States, she asked quietly, I hear that in the United States, you do not need una palanca, that even the poorest man can, get, can become rich if he works hard enough, which is an idea that really still resonates today. And that's one of the things that I really enjoy um, doing when I read this book with my students is talking about how much has immigration changed or hasn't changed in the past 80 years and the reasons for immigration have they changed. And is the, has the difference in opportunity changed, also the immigration experience? Um, 
you know, we find that in some ways it has, and in some ways it hasn't, as you might expect. Um, gets largely into the beginning of unionizing farm workers, kind of at the early phases, um, and especially how bad the working conditions were that led to the beginnings of unionization. So in the part that I'm going to read to you now, Esperanza and her mother have already made it across the border. They're living in California doing agricultural work um, with Miguel and his family. They're all living together in a kind of a small place that Esperanza is pretty shocked by that new reality of her life, too, to begin with. Um, and the other thing I really love about this book is it really, uh, you know, Esperanza is the narrator. She's the main character. And it really walks you through this whole process of how her eyes open to you know, how she kind of develops a class consciousness and in her change from, you know, being rich in Mexico to being poor in the United States and really focuses on kind of her internal growth as a person in a way that's really appropriate to sixth graders. Um, and I can't find the place where I was going to start. Okay. Esperanza let herself be led through the crowd. Someone from town had brought a litter of kittens. A group of girls were crowded next to the cardboard box, cooing and cradling them. It was clear that Isabel desperately wanted one. In this part, they're at, they're at a party that's kind of a community gathering. Um, Esperanza whispered to her, I will go ask your mother. She wove back through the crowd to find Josefina, and when she agreed, Esperanza practically ran back to the spot to tell Isabel. But when she got there, a bigger crowd had gathered, and something else was going on. Marta and some of her friends stood in the bed of a truck that was parked nearby, each of them holding up one of the tiny kittens. This is what we are, she yelled, small, meek animals, and that is how they treat us because we don't speak up. If we don't ask for what is rightfully ours, we will never get it. Is this how we want to live? She held the kitten up by the back of the neck, waving it high in the air. It hung limp in front of the crowd. With no decent home and at the mercy of those bigger than us, richer than us, Isabel trembled, her eyes in a panic. Will she drop it? A man called out. Maybe all that cat wants to do is feed its family. Maybe it doesn't care what all the other cats are doing. Senor, does it not bother you that some of your compadres live better than others? Yelled one of Marta's friends. We are going to strike in two weeks at the peak of the cotton for higher wages and better housing. We don't pick cotton on this farm, yelled another man from their camp. What does it matter, yelled Marta. If we all stop working, if all the Mexicans are juntos, together, she made a fist and held it up in the air, then maybe it will help us all. He yelled back, that is a chance we cannot take. We just want to work. That is why we came here. Get out of our camp. A cheer rose up around him. People started shoving, and Esperanza grabbed Isabel's hand and pulled her aside. A young man jumped into the truck and started the engine. Marta and the others tossed the kittens into the field. They pulled some of their supporters into the back of the truck with them, and raised their arms, chanting, well, got, well, got, strike, strike. Okay, and then Esperanza returns home and she's talking with one of her friends that lives in her camp, trying to kind of put the pieces together and figure out what's going on. Um, and she asks, why is, why is Marta so angry? She and her mother move around to find work, sometimes all over the state said Josefina. They work wherever there is something to be harvested. Those camps, the migrant camps, are the worst. Like when we were in El Centro, said Isabel. Worse, said Josefina. Our camp is a company camp, and people who work here don't leave. Some live here for many years. That is why we came to this country, to work, to take care of our families, to become citizens. We are lucky because our camp is better than most. There are many of us who don't want to get involved in the strike because we can't afford to lose our jobs, and we are accustomed to how things are in our little community. 